Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our next session in our RCIA inquiry. I'm Thomas Smith. I'm excited to be with you again on your journey, on your path towards God. Uh, I'm sorry that it's uh, in a virtual situation, but it is what it is. We have to just take each day at a time. And I hope this finds you uh, blessed. I hope this finds you flourishing in faith. As always, we want to begin with a word of prayer. That helps uh, set our focus, set our hearts, set our attention on the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, we are so grateful for the gift of this day, for blessings seen and unseen. We're so grateful for your word, which your people, your church, has compiled, protected, preserved, and preached uh, from its very inception. We thank you that this word is living and it still speaks to us today, that it has continual relevance to the world. It is perennial for your people. And we ask for your Holy Spirit that inspired this word to speak deeply into our life, to help us experience this as a living word. And we ask especially today for the special intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that phenomenal figure who welcomed your word so completely that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we pray the Hail Mary as an expression of our desire for her help, that we may welcome the word similarly. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. You know, we often speak of the Word of God as God's uh, love letter to us, and, and it is just that. In fact, I was just looking in the Catechism of the Catholic Church recently, and in the section on Scripture, it uses some really beautiful language. Uh, you have a catechism uh, you received along with your Bible, and as you know, uh, when we refer to a place in the catechism, we don't refer to a page number, because there's several different versions. Uh, uh, not versions, but bindings of the catechism, so the page number might be different. So we go by paragraph number. So if you've got your catechism, turn to paragraph number 104. It'll be near the front of your catechism. And this is what it says. In sacred scripture, the church constantly finds her nourishment and her strength in the scriptures. For she welcomes the scriptures not as a human word, but as what it really is, the word of of God. In the sacred books, the Father who is in heaven comes lovingly to meet his children, and he talks with them. Uh, much of that language is taken from Vatican Council II on the document on Scripture called Dei Verbum. Vatican Council II was held in the 1960s. It was the church reassessing its relationship to the world, and while keeping our faith intact, looking for new and fresh ways to meet the modern world. And it has a wonderful document on sacred scripture uh, called Dei Verbum. And what it speaks to here is the very personal nature of scripture, that it is a message of love. It's the Father speaking to us, and as we pray with scripture, we are speaking back to the Father. And so it's intended to be a real conversation. Sometimes you'll hear people speak of the canon of Scripture. Canon is a word that means the measure or the rule. Uh, that's another way of just speaking of the whole Bible. Uh, the books of the Old Testament, there's 46 of them. And the books of the New Testament, there's 27 of those. And that makes up the 73 books of our Bible. Uh, the Bible can be overwhelming, right? It's a huge book. And so we're also going to give you some tools for how to navigate the Bible, uh, how to know where to begin if we want to begin, begin a, a methodical study of the Scripture. But what's most important for us to remember is that though there are 73 books of the Bible, it is a story, not a myth, not a fairy tale. But because God has hardwired us for, for story, he's going to reveal the truths of salvation in the midst of a narrative, in the midst of families and tribes and nations and peoples. And it's a way for us to also enter the story. Uh, even before I came into the Catholic Church, uh, I've had a great love for the Scripture. And most of my ministry over the past 25 years as a Catholic has been in relationship to the Word of God. Uh, 
I serve as a, a speaker and a teacher with Ascension Press, who published what's called the Great Adventure Bible Timeline, which is ways for us to navigate Scripture. I've been the director of the Denver Catholic Biblical School and the Denver Catholic Catechetical School. Both of those institutions have as their aim to teach adult Catholics the Word of God. And so the Biblical School, for example, was a four-year program, college level with credits, to help Catholics enter as adults into these books of Scripture. Uh, with Ascension Press, I've also written many Bible studies, including the ones on the book of Revelation, uh, the Old Testament prophets, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, that's books like Proverbs and Sirach, and Paul's letter to the Ephesians. But my relationship with the Bible uh, started out pretty rocky, actually. When I was about eight years old, I found a $20 bill in my church parking lot. Uh, like the good Cub Scout that I was, I took it to my Sunday school teacher and I told her I found it, and she said, you know what, I'll ask around this week, and if no one claims that $20, uh, when I see you next Sunday, I'll give it back to you. So, of course, all week long, I was imagining what I'm going to spend my money on, what I'm going to do with that $20. It was the era of Star Wars, and so I was imagining and then going to the store and pricing out uh, this particular action figures that I wanted. When Sunday rolled around, I excitedly found uh, my Sunday school teacher, and she said, good news, Thomas, uh, no one claimed that $20, and so I went out this weekend and bought you a Bible with it and had your name engraved on the front of it. Well, as you can imagine, uh, I was pretty disappointed. I wish I could say I was spiritual and I accepted that, but I, I was pretty unhappy that my first gift was a Bible. But you know what? I still own that Bible today, 40 plus years later, and I treasure it. And I treasure that teacher who gave me the gift of the sacred scriptures, even though I didn't appreciate it until much later in my life. Well, as Catholics, of course, the scriptures are the basis of everything we believe uh, is in its seed form in the sacred scriptures. It is divine revelation. And so we want to make sure you, as someone who's discerning, becoming part of our faith community, that you have as many resources as possible to learn the Bible. And one of the wonderful things our parish invests in that you already know about is formed.org. It's free to sign up. Uh, you've probably already done that. You just select this parish community, Holy Spirit Catholic Community in Pocatello. You give them your email, you set up a password, and you are in. And available at your fingertips are not only books and popular movies that have faith topics, but countless hours of Bible studies on books of the Bible, like Philippians, on topics of the Bible, like prayer or Mary or salvation, uh, on people in the Bible, like Mark or Paul or others. And so it's a really extraordinary gift. We have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to our Catholic faith. And I'm really proud that uh, so many of the contributors to this formed series uh, are dear friends of mine uh, and colleagues that have enriched my uh, study of Scripture. And of course, one of the other great resources within form.org is Symbolon. That's the program of RCIA or the Rite of Christian Initiation that you're part of now. You've already experienced some facets of Symbolon. And so we want to turn our attention over to some selections from Symbolon on the Bible, and then we'll come back and discuss some other resources we have for you and some personal reflections I have on the sacred scriptures. So let's turn our attention to Symbolon and what they can share with us about the Word of God. When pilgrims visit the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls in Rome, they are greeted by an impressive statue of the Apostle Paul, the great apostle to the nations who brought the gospel to the heart of the Roman Empire. The statue depicts him holding a book in one hand and a sword in the other. 
The book symbolizes the many letters he wrote to the churches he founded, and the sword recalls the way Paul was martyred. He was beheaded by the Romans. But the sword also can be seen as symbolizing the Word of God in sacred scripture, which Paul himself described as the sword of the Spirit. Through the scriptures, God seeks to actively communicate with us, guide our lives, and arm us with a powerful weapon for the spiritual battles we face each day. Indeed, St. Paul taught that every Christian must be equipped with the Word of God. The Bible is different from any other book ever written. Other religious texts may reflect man's search for God, but through the Bible, God takes the initiative and communicates with us. It alone is inspired by God. But what does that mean? The word inspiration literally means God breathed. God breathed forth his divine word through the words of men. In this way, the Holy Spirit influenced human writers like St. Paul to write not just their own words, but God's words. This is why the scriptures are not simply stories from a long time ago. They're more like love letters from our Heavenly Father. As the Catholic Church teaches, in the sacred text, the Father who is in heaven comes lovingly to meet his children and talks with them. Mary, we're talking about the Bible and how Christians believe that God speaks to us through the scriptures, but is that really believable? I mean, this idea that God inspires prophets and human writers and even talks to us today through these written texts, is that, that almost sounds like a, a little fairy tale, many people would wonder. So what would you say in response to people who have those questions about the believability of God communicating himself to us today? Mm. Yes, I think many people have this idea of God as an absentee God, a God who maybe set the world in motion and then has nothing to do with it ever since then. But in reality, God is a God who from the very dawn of human history has been reaching down into a lost and broken world and seeking a relationship with the human beings he created in his image and seeking to initiate a conversation. God did that first through creation itself the beauty and the magnificence and the order of everything he made speaks and tells us there's a God who loves us. And then God has spoken through the history of Israel, his chosen people, and all the great deeds that he did for them, and all that's been handed down through the law and the prophets. And then God has spoken most fully in his own beloved son, who actually entered into human history, who became a human being, so that we could actually see the face of God. And, and Jesus Christ is everything God ever wanted to say to us. So we have a God who loves us enough to want to enter into a relationship with us. And he wants to continue that relationship and that dialogue through the scriptures. But another question people may have is this, you know, there, I know Christians revere the Bible, but there, there are many other religious books that are out there, a lot of different religions in the world, and they all have their own sacred texts. What makes the Bible different? Well, all the holy books of the great religions of the world are expressions, many of them beautiful expressions, of the human search for the ultimate, for truth and for meaning and for God. But sacred scripture, we believe, is God's revelation to us. It's God himself speaking and revealing who he is and what his plan is for us. Now in doing that, God made use of human authors. So God is the primary author of scripture, but he made use of authors like Jeremiah and Isaiah 
and St. Paul and St. Matthew. And some people think of that as uh, the human authors being dictaphones to whom God dictated every word. But the Catholic view is that the human authors of Scripture were truly genuine authors. And therefore, they used their own ways of thinking, their own ways of speaking. They spoke out of their own cultural context in their own language and were completely free as authors. And yet, God used them, the Holy Spirit inspired them to say exactly what God wanted said to us, no more and no less. So the Bible didn't just come down from heaven like in a parachute. Uh, so God's working with human beings, uh, inspiring them to communicate his word to us. Now, uh, when it comes to us personally, when we open up the Bible and we're going to study it, we're going to pray over it, uh, can we really believe that God is speaking to me today when I open up these sacred scriptures? Absolutely. I think a lot of people are intimidated by the Bible because it was written 2,000 years ago. But as one of the fathers of the church said, scripture was written so that a mouse can wade in it and an elephant can swim in it. In other words, a beginner, a person who doesn't have a theology degree, can open scripture and understand what it says and hear the voice of their heavenly father speaking. And on the other hand, an expert, a, a theologian, somebody who's been reading scripture their whole life, can open and, and read the same passage they've read a hundred times before and find new depth in it and understand new things about God. And God does speak to us personally. It makes me think of an example in my own life. Years ago, my dad had an accident. He fell off the third story of a building and he was taken to the hospital unconscious. We didn't know if he had broken his neck or if he was going to die. Um, and my mom and I were there and we were very anxious as you can imagine. But we decided to stop and pray and a scripture verse came to my mind. It's from Philippians chapter 4. And it says, Be anxious about nothing, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. So my mom and I took that word seriously, and we just gave over our anxiety to God, and we trusted in Him that He was in control and that He knew what He was doing. We prayed for my dad. And it turned out he had broken his collarbone, but he, he was okay. He was fine. But that word had such a power in our lives. It, it freed us from a, a panic and anxiety. And, and we knew that God was speaking to us directly through it. What advice would you have then for people who are beginners with the Bible? Uh, that maybe they've never really opened up the scriptures, studied it, or used it for prayer that much. What would you recommend for first steps? I would recommend that people begin with a simple um, reading of a book of the Bible, perhaps a gospel, maybe the gospel of Luke. And I would just encourage them, God is waiting for you there in his word. He has things he wants to say to you personally that are different from what he says to anybody else. And he'll do that as you begin to read his word. Read a little bit every day, make an appointment, in the morning is the best time, and just be there with the Lord, maybe drink a cup of coffee and be comfortable, read his word, think about it, and then speak back to him in prayer. And you will begin to see this relationship grow and flourish as you are hearing the loving words of your heavenly father. Well, Dr. Mary Healy and Ted spoke about how we view the Word of God as simultaneously human and divine, as something we also say of Jesus, that the Lord speaks exactly what He wants us to hear in the sacred scriptures while using imperfect vessels, human beings, their own culture, their own background, their own experiences to communicate those particular truths. Mary also shared a wonderful story of the personal and practical power of Scripture in her life and how a particular Scripture from Philippians on anxiety helped her and her mother during a very difficult time. And 
that's also my relationship with the Word of God. Part of my motivation for why I'm so committed to teaching Scripture to Catholics is because the Scripture has spoken so deeply in my life and healed me uh, in areas I didn't even know I was fundamentally broken. I didn't grow up in a religious home. I grew up uh, with two alcoholic fathers. My birth father was a very violent alcoholic. He broke my mother's jaw so severely that uh, she had her wired shut and she had to eat all of her meals through a straw for, I think, six weeks. Uh, he died when I was uh, around seven or eight years old. And then sadly, my mother remarried another alcoholic and that pattern repeated. Though my parents weren't religious, I actually became very religious thanks to my grandparents. And although I went to church every Sunday, I had my nose in the Bible, uh, I really had a very dark and unforgiving heart. Uh, I hated both of those men. Uh, I believe I was completely justified in hating them because of the terrible things they did to my family. And so I cultivated in my heart a, a kind of seething anger and hatred for them over the years, even though I was personally very religious and loved God and was trying to serve God. Well, in my early 20s, I went from just knowing a lot about God to actually knowing God and having a personal experience of God. And I remember as I would open the Bible, it's like every page of the Bible was speaking a singular message to me. And you can imagine what that message was. It was a message of forgiveness, uh, whether it's in the Our Father prayer, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, or if we don't understand that completely, just a few verses later, Jesus clarifies, unless you forgive others their sins, uh, our Heavenly Father cannot forgive you. There's a certain power in forgiving others. To not forgive another is like drinking the poison you intend for your enemy. It corrodes our soul. It destroys us from within. But when we can fully forgive, uh, then our heart is available to receive the fullness of God's grace and mercy to us. Forgiveness of others, of course, doesn't mean that what they did was okay. But it's putting that in the past. It's moving on. It's trying to see them with the eyes of God. And if you've ever tried to forgive someone, you know it's not very easy. <coughs> Excuse me. It took months and months and months. And I remember when I would get that impulse, I would say to God, I just can't do it. I can't forgive them. But I would hear in my deepest being, uh, just give me your heart, Thomas. And if you give me your heart, I can change it. And so that's all I could do in the beginning was just give him my heart and ask the Lord to help me to see my fathers as God sees them, as people deserving of love, of deserving of forgiveness, of human beings, though broken themselves, uh, they have their own story. And over time, that forgiveness came. I was able to go to my father's grave and, and um, offer my forgiveness there. And I was able to cultivate a relationship with my stepdad, who was still living at the time, and learn his story. And my life was transformed, so much so that the end of the life of the person I hated, my stepdad, uh, I was with him in his final days as he died. I spoon-fed him his meals. I changed his diapers. I loved him to death. And that's only possible by the Word of God, a Word of God that is living, a Word of God that still speaks into our life. And if we listen and respond, that Word can transform us, that Word can heal us. And so I, I challenge you to do the same thing. I don't know what your pain point is. I don't know what you particularly may be struggling with. But ask the Lord for the grace to direct your heart to the passage of Scripture that can speak into that pain point, that can give you wisdom, knowledge, hope and healing. Dr. Mary also mentioned the importance of just picking up a book of the Bible and reading it. And we've suggested as part of your formation and discernment to be reading through the Gospel of Mark, the shortest of our four Gospels. I hope you're continuing to do that and you're doing it on a daily basis. One of the wonderful blessings of being a Catholic is we have something called the lectionary. Lectionary um, comes from a word that means reader, or it's the readings. And every day of the week, uh, the church is guiding us through the Bible, passages from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, the songbook of the Bible, passages from the New Testament and from the gospel, 
So every day she is immersing us in the scriptures. And between the lectionary readings on Sunday and the daily readings and something called the Liturgy of the Hours, which are seven moments of prayer throughout the day, we are just being infused and in contact with the sacred scriptures. Uh, next time you're at one of our services, pick up a bulletin in the back, or you can get the bulletin at our website, hscc.org, digital version. And you'll find within the bulletin uh, a little section where the readings for the week are listed for you. And since you have probably your own Bible or you've got the copy that we gave you, it would be really helpful to look up those daily reading passages in your own Bible. It increases your familiarity with Scripture. Um, and it takes 10, 15 minutes to read the selections of the day, to reflect on them a little bit. And 10 or 15, 20 minutes, that's 2% of your day. Give the Lord 2% of your day and watch how he will leverage that encounter with his word into real uh, change of life and change of heart and an infusion of love into your life and joy and peace and a kind of confidence and power uh, to share with others how that word is speaking into your life. Some people today have a hard time believing that God took certain human beings and inspired them to write the Bible. And it's somewhat understandable given that a very popular view of God today is the absentee God, the God who may have created the universe and set it in motion, but he just sits back and watches us from a distance and does not get involved in this world. If I don't really believe that God interacts with this world, I'm gonna have a hard time believing that he inspired the Bible. But we have to ask ourselves, does that view of God make sense? Does it make sense to say that God doesn't interact in this world? Think about it. If there was a builder who created a great building, would it make sense to say that he can't walk into that building and interact with the people who dwell there? Of course not. How much more so if there's a God who created the universe, it wouldn't make sense to say that that God can't enter into his creation and interact with the people he brought into existence. Our God is a loving God, and He desires to be close to us, so it makes sense that He would seek us out and communicate Himself to us. And one of the main ways He does that is through the sacred scriptures. Now, we're about to get a brief overview of this great book, the Bible. But at first glance, the Bible appears to be more like a library than a single book. After all, it consists of 73 different books written by many different authors over many different time periods. What is it that ties all these books together? We're going to see that all these books have one common co-author, God, and they come together to tell one great story of God's plan of salvation. Then, we're also going to consider how do we know which books are actually a part of the Bible? There are many different texts that were used in early Christianity. We're gonna examine how the Bible came together and how the early Christians discerned which books would be a part of the sacred scriptures. Along these lines, we're going to ask the question, why are Catholic Bibles bigger? You may have noticed that Catholics have more books of the Bible than Protestant editions do. Why did Protestants leave out certain books of the Old Testament? And finally, how do we interpret the Bible correctly? Do we read the Bible literally? And how much of the Bible is true? The Holy Bible is composed of 73 books, 46 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. The Old Testament is composed of four major parts, the Pentateuch, the historical books, wisdom literature, and the prophets. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. It tells us about everything from the life of Adam all the way through the arrival of the people of Israel at the Promised Land. The historical books take us from the conquest of the Promised Land through the Maccabean Revolt in the second century BC. The wisdom literature includes the Psalms, which are text for worship, and advice about life in books like Job, Sirach, Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs. The prophets, who wrote the last section of the Old Testament, speak on behalf of God through different eras in Israel's history. Now in the New Testament, we have five major sections, the Gospels, 
the Acts of the Apostles, the Pauline Epistles, the Catholic Epistles, and the Book of Revelation. The Gospels tell the story of the life of Jesus. The Acts of the Apostles, often referred to as the Gospel of the Holy Spirit, tells what the Apostles did in the first few years after Jesus' ascension into heaven. The Pauline Epistles contain the letters of St. Paul. The Catholic Epistles contain the letters of other Apostles. And the Book of Revelation provides us the final unveiling of God's revelation and judgment at the end of time. There really is nothing like the Bible. 73 books written in three different languages over the course of centuries, and they all share the same story. There's a golden thread that's woven throughout all of Scripture. It's like each one of the stories taken individually is a little pearl, but when you look at the big picture, you have a beautiful strand. St. Jerome says, all of Scripture is one story, and that one story is Christ. The word canon is a Latin word that simply means list. So the list of books that are included in the Bible is referred to as the canon. So for a book to be included on that list makes it canonical. Now, early in the life of the church, the canon of the New Testament was not set in stone. There were several books that were competing for being a part of the, the Bible or not. And so the early saints and bishops had to argue over which books ought to be included in the New Testament. And over a period of time, a few criteria developed to help them establish which, which books should be included in the New Testament. And those criteria are these. First, a book had to be orthodox, meaning it taught true Christian doctrine. Second, it had to be universal, meaning it would be used throughout the Christian world. Three, it had to be liturgical, meaning it was read aloud in liturgy in the churches. And fourth, it had to be apostolic, meaning the book had to be written by an apostle or by one of the apostles' immediate disciples. Now, the list of the 27 books of the New Testament we first find in an official document from Pope Damasus in 382. And that's later reaffirmed by a meeting of bishops called the Synod of Hippo in 393. During the Protestant Reformation, a few of the reformers were considering getting rid of certain books of the New Testament that they didn't like, Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. So the Council of Trent had to uh, dogmatically reaffirm the canon of the New Testament as including all 27 of these books. It's important to remember that books of the Bible are included in the canon because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, not just because they're approved by the church. That is, the church has the authority to discern the canon, but not to create the canon. Some of you may have heard about some other Gospels that were written. The Gospel of Thomas, you may have heard of, or the Gospel of Philip, or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. These are known as the Gnostic Gospels, and the popular media today likes to talk about these Gospels, and they say that these Gospels can give us real information about the historical Jesus. But you need to know that these Gospels were written about 200 AD and afterwards, long after the life of Christ and his apostles. And these Gospels have strange ideas about Jesus and about the world. The Gnostics were a religious philosophical movement of thought that viewed the physical world as evil, the material world as bad and the spiritual world as good, and the God who created this world is evil. Strange ideas. But we're not going to get a lot of good historical information about the real Jesus from these texts that came so much later. We want to go back to the original Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which were written within a generation after Christ's lifetime in the first century. We have evidence as early as 125 AD of an early Christian leader by the name of Papias who talked about three Gospels, and he mentions not the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, he mentions Matthew, Mark, and John. By the time we get to 150 AD, we start seeing a number of leaders mentioning and affirming the fourfold gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, such as Justin Martyr in 150 AD, Tatian in 170 AD, Irenaeus in 177 AD, Tertullian in 200 AD. So there's a strong tradition about the fourfold gospel long before these are even being written. So these gospels are as far removed from the historical world of Jesus as we are today from the world of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. If I wanted to do a research project to understand the historical Abraham Lincoln, I'd want to go back to the early sources of, of Abraham Lincoln's life, people who worked with him, people who knew him, people who debated against him. I'd want to look at his writings. I'd want to go back to the beginning. I wouldn't want to go around to coffee houses today and just ask some teenager, hey, what are your opinions about Abraham Lincoln? What do you feel about Abraham Lincoln? Just ask people today. Now, that might give me some information about what people today think about Abraham Lincoln, but it's not going to give me a lot about the real historical Abraham Lincoln. We want to go back to the original sources, and that's what we want to do if we want to understand the real Jesus. 
We want to go back to the original sources, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why are Catholic Bibles different than Protestant Bibles? Catholics have 46 books in their Old Testament, and Protestants have 39. Why is that? Well, the ancient Jews handed down the Old Testament in two different forms. One form was in Hebrew, often referred to as the Tanakh, or Hebrew Bible, and that includes the 39 books which are in the Protestant canon. The other form is the Greek Bible, or the Septuagint, which contains the 46 books that Catholics use. Now, what are those books called that are in the Catholic canon that are not in the Protestant canon? They're called the Deuterocanonical books, or the second canon. They include books like Tobit, Judith, uh, Ecclesiasticus, additions to Esther and, and Daniel. And these books were included in very early lists in the Church's history of the, of the Old Testament canon, dating all the way to the late 4th century and the Synod of Hippo, uh, to Pope Innocent I's letter in 405 AD, and to the Council of Florence in 1442, and then finally at the Council of Trent in 1546, these books were reaffirmed in their canonical status. The first time we see a widespread limiting of the Old Testament scriptures to just 39 books comes in the time of the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther in the 1500s. Martin Luther rejected those deuterocanonical books because he saw the Jews in his day, in their Hebrew scriptures, only had the 39. They didn't have the deuterocanonical books. And he thought, wow, well, that's what the Jews are using. That must go all the way back to the earliest time of the Christian era and the time of Jesus and the apostles. If, in fact, you were to go all the way back, what you would discover is that there was no fixed canon. There was no sharply defined list of which books were a part of the Hebrew scriptures. Various groups used various books. And we know that a number of Jewish circles, in fact, did use the deuterocanonical books. So what happens is, as you move forward after the time of Jesus and the apostles, both the Jews and the Christian church are trying to discern, well, which books are a part of the Hebrew scriptures? The Jews end up landing on the 39 books, but that comes in the second, third, and fourth centuries AD. The Christian church in various councils in the late 300s determined that the deuterocanonical books indeed are a part of God's inspired scriptures. So 46 books are included in the canon of the Old Testament. So the question you and I have to ask is, who determines which books are a part of the Old Testament scriptures? And by what authority do they do that? Martin Luther sided with 39 books, but that reflects the tradition of Jewish, non-Christian rabbis in the second and third centuries, hundreds of years after Christ, making that decision. How much authority do Jewish rabbis in the New Covenant era of the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century, how much authority do they have to make decisions like that? None. What we want to do instead is follow the authority that Jesus Christ gave to the apostles and their successors in the church. And it was the church that included the deuterocanonical books and gave us the full 46 books of the Old Testament scriptures to be a part of the canon. The New Testament teaches us that all scripture is inspired by God. That word inspiration is a metaphor for breathing. It means that God breathed out the words of scripture, that he spoke the words of scripture himself. But we also have a human author for every book of sacred scripture. So somehow God as author and a human being as author work together to create sacred scripture. The church teaches us in Vatican II that in composing the sacred books, God chose men and while employed by him, they made use of their powers and abilities so that with him acting in them and through them, they as true authors consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. So God and man cooperate together to produce the words of sacred scripture. God inspires those words. Now the other thing that's really important to know here is that whatever the author intends to affirm in the text of sacred scripture, God intends to affirm since he's the author and he's inspiring what they write. So whatever scripture intends to affirm is error free. Do you take the Bible literally? That's a common question we get, especially in our very secular society where people are afraid that if you're religious, you're gonna be a fundamentalist. That if you want to take the Bible seriously, you're going to be narrow-minded. And the answer for us as Catholics to the question, do you take the Bible literally, is I take the Bible literarily. And that means I'm attentive to what the author and what the Word of God is intending 
to communicate and I take that seriously. So if the author is using something metaphorically, like in the Song of Songs, when in chapter four, verse one, it says, her eyes are doves. I don't take that literalistically and in such a literal flat-footed wooden way that I think that she actually has doves in her eye sockets. But no, I take it poetically as the author intended, as a beautiful metaphor to the beauty of her eyes that dance and sparkle and move with the grace of doves that capture and flit and capture this young man's eyes. Now, on the other hand, if I take a book like the Gospel of Luke, who means something literarily with historical intention and accuracy, when Luke says that the tomb was empty and that Jesus rose from the dead, then I take that as a metaphysical truth, a historical truth. The tomb is empty. Jesus has indeed risen bodily from the dead. St. Paul teaches us in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the inspiration and inerrancy of sacred scripture is very important to us because it means that we can rely on sacred scripture for the truth, we can rely on sacred scripture for training in righteousness, we can rely on sacred scripture to grow in holiness and in love of God and one another. What are some of the main things we want to make sure we know about the Bible? First, the different books of the Bible have God as their author and they come together to tell the one story of salvation culminating in the person of Jesus Christ. Second, we considered how the canon, the list of the biblical books, came to be. And here we saw that the early church tended to use various criteria to discern the books of the Bible. A text needed to be orthodox, meaning it has right doctrine. It needed to be Catholic, meaning it was used universally in the church. It needed to be liturgical, used for worship, and it also had to be apostolic, meaning it was written by an apostle or a disciple of an apostle. But in the end, we saw that it was the authority of the Catholic Church that discerned which writings were to be officially included in the list of the sacred books. Then we came back to the topic of inspiration. What does it mean when we say that all scripture is inspired by God? In a sense, the Bible is like Jesus. Jesus was fully human and fully divine, and the scriptures also have a human and a divine dimension. The scriptures are human in the sense that they were written by human authors who were free to write whatever they wanted written. And yet the scriptures also have a divine dimension. And here's the mystery, that whatever the human writers consigned to writing was what God wanted written and no more. Then we looked at how to read the Bible. Do we take the Bible literally? Here we saw that as Catholics, we're not called to interpret the Bible literalistically like a fundamentalist, but we do read the Bible literarily, meaning that we take very seriously the author's intention, the literary genres employed, the historical context, and the modes of narrating that were common in the time. And when we interpret the Bible correctly in this way, we see that the Bible teaches the truth, that whatever the human author intends to affirm is affirmed by the Holy Spirit and therefore without error so that we can know with confidence God's revelation for our lives. Teresa, how important is the Bible for a Catholic's life? Well, I heard someone say that the word Bible is actually an acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, and that is so true. It's God's Word. It is His love letter. It's His instructions to us about how we should live our life. And a good friend of mine, I think you know him, he's a, a Bible expert, now John Martinoni from EWTN Catholic Television and Radio, says there's nothing in the Catholic Church that contradicts the Bible, and there's nothing in the Bible that contradicts the Catholic Church. So the old Prego spaghetti sauce commercial, it's all in there. Everything that we do as Catholics is, is very scriptural as well. But for me, it is, it is a love letter from God. And I am totally head over heels in love with Jesus. And if I want to know him better, then I need to be in his word regularly. How is it a love letter from God? In what sense? Because he is communicating with us directly through the scriptures. We know that this is God-inspired. That's what we learn um, in the Catholic faith, that this comes directly from, um, from God himself telling us his, his story, his story giving it to us personally. And if we want to get to know someone, it's important we spend time with them. And it's right, a great right. gift that he gives that, the scriptures to us. Tell me about how do we in incorporate the scriptures into our, our daily spiritual life? Well, it's so easy now, so much more than it was even 10, 15 years ago because of all the different technology that's available. For example, this discussion we're having right now that we're recording, you also have hard copy things which we call 
devotionals. They're little books that give us the daily readings of the Mass, which is very easy to follow because, of course, the cycle of readings, it's all laid out for us. And there's, for example, the Magnificat is one devotional that I use. Or there's another devotional called the Word Among Us. Or we have One Bread, One Body. These are all Catholic devotionals, books that put together for us the cycle of the reading so we can follow every single day and be in tune with the church all around the world. So when you take time to pray with the scriptures, what does that look like? Tell me step by step, what do you do? Well, I host a daily Catholic uh, radio show in the morning. And so what I like to do is read the scriptures before I go on the air. It just helps me set my day, set the tone. And so I get my Bible and I get my, I use the Magnificat and I also use occasionally the Word Among Us devotional. And I have the Bible there, but I go right to the readings for the day, the Mass readings for the day. And then if I have time, I will go back to the Bible and read more of that particular chapter, whether we're reading something in the first reading from the Old Testament, or if we're looking at, you know, whatever the particular gospel um, passages for that day. I like to see, okay, where was Jesus and what was he doing? And so you go a little bit before the gospel, a little bit after, it gives you more of a context. So you kind of picture uh, my office or my kitchen table with the Bible, and another devotional out there. And the devotionals are helpful because they help explain the scripture right. classes, they give us something to think about. That, that's the other thing too, I'm, gra I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes we can open the Bible and we can read something and it may be very clear to us. Other times it might be a little bit complicated, we don't understand what the, what the writer was trying to say to us. And so what the Catholic Church does is in these devotionals, it'll have a reflection, maybe something from Blessed John Paul II, maybe one of the saints, and they will comment on that particular reading and help us apply it to our life. Now, what if someone doesn't have access to a devotional? They just have the Bible. They can still have a profound encounter with the Word of God. Absolutely, and I, and I think uh, it's important to you know, maybe pray before you open the Bible and say, Lord, what should I read? Should I go to the Old Testament? Should I go to the New Testament? If you want to start in the Gospels and you're concerned about a lot of time, Mark is the shortest Gospel, so read the Gospel of Mark. That's a suggestion a lot of people make. But um, I find that really just thinking, what do I want to learn about? Do I want to go further back, you know, before the time of Christ and learn about David or do I want to learn about Queen Esther or one of these great people that we have from the Old Testament? It depends. But, but the important thing is to pray before you do it, to ask God to show you because He'll direct you. And isn't it amazing when you are prayerful and you're reading the scriptures, how much you really sense God is speaking to you and it applies to something going on in your life right now? Oh, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's actually kind of funny because I have this thing with God. I'm like, are you serious? This is like so apropos. I mean, and it also ties into things that are going on in the world. I remember when the first cases came up at the Supreme Court regarding the Ten Commandments and the placement of the Ten Commandments. I forget which building it was and where was it and someone was fighting it. They wanted to remove the Ten Commandments from the wall. That very day, that when the case was being taken up, it was all about the importance of the commandments. You mean the, the mass reading? The mass reading for that day. It was uncanny. And I had a newspaper on my kitchen table and I was reading the readings and I'm looking over and seeing the headline. I'm like, okay, I think you're trying to tell us something. And he does, <laughs> he speaks to us in his word. St. Paul taught all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is why in the Catholic Church we are completely surrounded by the scriptures. Everywhere we turn we encounter the Word of God, in all the prayers of the Mass, in the rituals of the sacraments, in the hymns we sing, and in the art that decorates our churches. But ultimately, God wants to write his word on our hearts. In other words, he doesn't want the Bible to be merely a book that sits on the shelf, but a word that shapes our entire lives. Indeed, Jesus is longing to speak to you personally through his scriptures. Will you listen to him? Will you take time to open your Bible, study it, pray with it, and hear the voice of Jesus Christ guiding your life? Well, I know we covered a lot of material in that section from where did the Bible come from? How did the books of the Bible come to be? What we believe about how the Bible can still speak into our life? What about other books we hear about? Gnostic Gospels like the Gospel of Thomas. 
So it's worth actually re-listening to that section again when you get a chance because it really addresses a broad spectrum of questions and concerns and interests that people have around the Bible. You know, as part of your journey, uh, your spiritual walk, we want to give you as many resources as possible. We've mentioned Formed. Of course, we have the whole RCIA process to connect you to this living word. And I just want to mention a final resource uh, that I touched on briefly at the beginning. It's called the Great Adventure Bible Timeline. And it's a resource developed by uh, a couple good friends of mine, Jeff Cavins, Sarah Chris Meyer, and uh, Dr. Tim Gray, who you saw in the video um, uh, just a moment ago. And it's it's a way to navigate the scriptures, uh, scriptures that can otherwise become uh, very overwhelming. We'll have this resource available to you. It's just a little pamphlet that can uh, fit in the back of your Bible. It's about half the size of a full sheet of paper. So you just fold a sheet of paper in half to get a sense of how big this is. And it's gonna be one of the most important things you can have uh, as you're reading and studying and navigating the Bible. It's just an extraordinary uh, resource. It's, at one sense, a compass to help you find your way through the Bible. It's a map that gives you a sense of where things are taking place, the culture in which it's been spoken. Uh, It gives you kind of a a point of where you are, a kind of GPS for where you are in your spiritual life in relationship to the texts and the stories of Scripture. And uh, it's, it's a way to help you really just continue to navigate your journey going forward as this kind of a compass of the spiritual principles and values for you. And, you know, a lot of people have great intentions around the Bible. Uh, maybe you've done this before. One of your New Year's resolutions is I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover. And so January 1st rolls around and you get break out your Bible. Maybe you even buy a new Bible thinking that might be an extra motivation. And you start reading through the scriptures. Uh, in Genesis, you get the wonderful creation stories. You get the stories of figures like Abraham and Sarah. And you get the great story of the Exodus and Moses and the giving of the Ten Commandments in the second book of the Bible, Exodus. Uh, But even then, there's some challenges. You might run into something like a genealogy, a long list of this person begat this person who begat this person. And you can get a little bit lost, but you, you, you press on through those. But then after Genesis and Leviticus, we all experience something like this. And it's a book called Leviticus. And Leviticus isn't telling a narrative. It isn't telling a story. It's not that kind of book. It's, it's a lot of ritual references on how to barbecue your sacrifice <laughs> and uh, areas of uh, themes of uncleanness and cleanness and uh, spiritual holidays, which we don't celebrate today as Christians. And so it's really easy to get lost and to give up and become confused because the things mentioned in Leviticus don't directly apply to us today. They were important for their time, and they were written in a particular cultural context. It doesn't mean we can't draw spiritual principles from that, but if we're used to following a story, the story seems to terminate with Leviticus, and that's where a lot of people just stop reading the Bible and the New Year's resolution falters. And so the Great Adventure Bible Timeline has a singular aim. It's helping you find and keep the story through all of Scripture. Because as we mentioned before, there's a lot of books of the Bible, 73 books. But even though there's such a variety of books written to many different audiences in many different countries and in multiple languages, they're telling one singular story. And the good news is that story is your story. So the Great Adventure Timeline is going to help you see how all those books fit together and help you find and keep the story. So you're going to learn why Leviticus is important, but you'll understand also that it isn't part of the narrative story books. And so we'll help you go from Genesis and Exodus, pass over Leviticus for the time being, to the continuation of the story, which is going to be the book of Joshua, for example. And so although there are 73 books in the Bible, there's going to be 14 narrative books, books that are keeping that story told in a consistent, unbroken way from Genesis until the end of the Bible in the New Testament. And so some of the ways that 
Bible Timeline is going to help you do this is through some of the tools that are built into it. So if you look uh, on the screen in front of you, this is kind of the little table of contents at the beginning of the timeline that we'll give you a copy of. And you'll see uh, on that table of contents the, the resources. So it's going to divide the Bible up into 12 historical periods. They're going to be color-coded as a kind of memory device. And if you look at the center of that chart um, page, you'll see a little what looks like a little scroll. And you'll see a period color key there. So that's going to give you those 12 periods and a color associated with that period that acts as a kind of memory device. Similar to you might remember when you learned the letter A, they showed you also a picture of an apple which was colored red. And that's how our mind works, actually. So this is going to help you uh, navigate uh, the books and to remember the books of the Bible. So there's 12 periods of the Bible that all the books fit into. Then it's going to identify for you on the top of the Bible timeline what are called the narrative books. Those are the books that help you keep the story of salvation. Uh, they're also going to list for you the, the, where the other books fit in as well. So we'll show you that in a moment. We'll also show you what's called God's family plan which is a series of covenants that God enacts with figures like Adam and Eve, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and culminating with the coming of Jesus. The Bible timeline also gives you an actual map. So you'll see a bunch of events unfold as you unfold the timeline and look at uh, front and back. And where those events appear on the timeline is going to be in relationship to specific geography. So if you look in the center, what's called the land of Canaan or Palestine, or we call it Israel today. If you see an event in that area of the unfolded timeline, you know that it's happening in the Holy Land. If you see it to the south, it's happening outside the Holy Land or in an ancient country like Egypt or in the north in places like Syria or Babylon. Uh, and that helps you kind of get a sense of where you are in terms of geography. We'll also identify where the other books that aren't the narrative books fit into the story. Leviticus fits into the story. Books like the Psalms, song books of the Lord, they fit into the story. And we'll show you where they fit in. We'll also identify for you the world powers of the day. So who was in charge of the then known world? Countries like Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. Alexander the Great, of course. And moments in secular history that occur uh, during the same time events in the Bible are happening, like when uh, was the Great Wall of China built? Uh, where does Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle fit um, on the timeline of when events are happening in the Bible? And then if you look at just one of those color-coded sections, uh, you can get a sense of this. So if you look at the very top, you'll see one of the 12 periods that I mentioned is Conquest and Judges. So this is when the children of Israel escape Egyptian bondage and they head back to the land. You'll see right under that header is the narrative books for this period that are going to help you find and keep the story. So those books are Joshua and Judges and the first few chapters of Samuel. You'll see in the center just a little help on the 12 judges that you're going to meet in this section of the Bible and a five-part theme that you're going to see. You'll see a red line going through the center of the timeline. And that's the bloodline or the genealogy of Jesus and how his story is kind of weaving its way through the Old Testament narrative. As I mentioned, you'll see important events listed there. There's over 60 of them on the Bible timeline. And because they're in that very center of the timeline, you know these events are happening within the, or around the Holy Land. So things like the fall of the city of Jericho or the reallotment of the land or Israel seeking a king. Uh, which is event number 36 there. Along the bottom, remember, we teach you about where the supplemental or non-narrative books fit in telling the story of salvation. So you'll see down below in that green bar, the little book of Ruth. You don't need Ruth to find and keep the story, but it's important to situate Ruth historically in that story. And then you come back and study that book of Ruth later. You see that Egypt is the major world power at the time, and then you get some secular history. For example, who were the pharaohs during this time? Pharaohs like Ramses II and Seti uh, I. So that's just kind of helpful uh, for you to understand. As I said, there's usually some little helps like the 12 judges in that period 
Uh, again, the narrative book at the bottom. So if you look at the timeline, it's pretty gigantic. You can see just on one side of it, those some of those color-coded periods, uh, how you're going to navigate the book. If we zero in on, for example, the purple period, the royal kingdom, this is where King David lived. You can, again, see what are the narrative books for this period of the story. Books like Samuel and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings. You get a list of the kings who are in the bloodline of Jesus. For example, uh, David and Solomon, uh, who are figures we've heard of before. You get all the supplemental books that are happening during this narrative period. Uh, books like Chronicles, the Psalms, Song of Solomon, and so on. So really super resource for you to have. If you go to the kingdoms following that, again, you'll just see similar resources. Uh, if you get lost in the many kings when the kingdoms divide, We've spelled that out for you, the names of all those kings, the prophets that spoke to that period in those particular periods, the important events that happened in those periods. So you've got a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom at a certain point in Israel's history. And we help you navigate those and then learn how particular prophets like the prophet Amos might be speaking into that period of time or Isaiah later is going to speak to the southern kingdom. So it's really extraordinary all the resources you have. And if that particular prophet that's speaking also has a book associated with his preaching, we've listed those books for you along the bottom of the page. So for example, Amos and Isaiah were both writing prophets. And then we've got the period of exile and eventually the, the period of the church by the time we get to the New Testament and how the church grows. I already mentioned before that uh, Boy, take advantage of the daily readings. It's really, it's like your mother giving you the food for the day. Uh, find the readings for the day. You can not only do that through, as I mentioned, the bulletin of the parish, but if you go to your Android app store or your iPhone app store and just type in Catholic Mass readings, there are dozens of apps that can give you the readings for the day. Uh, or you can go to the uh, U.S. Catholic Bishop's website, usccb.org and all the daily readings are going to be there for you. In fact, there's a podcast of them in an audio format. So there's every opportunity for us to let the word to speak more deeply and richly into our life. And as some of the teachers in the videos mentioned, uh, create a conversation with the word of God. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to have concerns. Every question or even doubt that you have is important. We want to help to explore that with you. So um, if you have questions or concerns, uh, reach out to me, reach out to Scott, reach out to Bruce, and we can help you as you navigate the scriptures because those kind of questions will come up. Of course, take advantage of the resources at form.org. Maybe just look at a topic, a person of the Bible or a book of the Bible you might be interested in and watch some of those videos in the coming weeks and months ahead. Uh, it's been a real delight uh, to be with you on this spiritual journey. Uh, I appreciate your patience and prayers for my mom as she continues to recover. We were able to bring her home last night uh, after a couple nights in the hospital. Uh, so I, I pray for, again, pray for your continued patience for me as I, I try to navigate the, the service I'm offering the parish and, and her care. And be assured of my prayers for you as you continue to study the Word of God and experience its power and presence in your life. God bless.